Okay, so here's the situation. You've been playing in church for a little while now and you're totally cool with playing the standard rock beats. You know, boom, gotch, boom, boom, gotch. And then it goes with most things until that one week where your pastor goes, I think we need to play that old hymn. And it's in 3-4 time. Now what do you do? In this video, I will be showing you a super useful beat to play if you're ever in that kind of a situation. It's my absolute favorite for playing in 3-4 time, especially in a worship setting, and I will be trying to explain this in the next 60 seconds. Let's go. Most of the time when we play drum beats, we're playing the back beats on 2 and 4 on the snare drum. Now in 3-4 time, you don't have beat 4 anymore, so if you just cut off that last beat and repeat the first 3, your drum beats might sound a little bit empty and strange. One way to get around this would be to add another snare hit on count 3 instead, which will give you a drum beat that sounds like this. But that's rather straight and it has that old-timey waltz feel, which may not be what you're trying to get at. A slightly cooler way to do this would be to syncopate the groove slightly by taking that first snare hit and moving it forward in time by 1 16th note. That means you're now playing the snare on the uh of 1, as well as count 3. With the bass drum note on 1, this is how it would sound. For the song In Christ Alone, I went ahead and added one more bass drum note on the N of 2. Here's how it sounds in the context of some music. If you were just looking for a quick fix to help you play a 3-4 song that you need to figure out, I hope that was useful for you. Of course, all these accents are really up to personal taste. You can try out putting the snare backbeat accents on whichever account you want, basically. But this was just one example that I found to be a rather versatile beat that is also really easy for the rest of your band to follow. You can also create different textures by just moving your right hand to different surfaces, so you don't have to just play in the hi-hat, you can play it on the ride cymbal, floor tom, or take the whole thing and use it as an accent pattern on the snare. All of those are methods I used when I was crafting the drum parts for the song In Christ Alone, and for the rest of this video, I will be going through a slightly more detailed breakdown of those parts. If you haven't checked out the drum playthrough to that song yet, I would encourage you to do that so that you get a better idea of what we're talking about here. Or if you're just the kind of person that wants to see a song played and not talked to death about, then please do yourself a favor, just go watch that. But if you're the kind of person who wants a bit more explanation, then hang in there, getting to it. This cover was a little bit different from the usual because, for once, I was not trying to figure out what somebody else played on the track. I know, I know. Who are you? What have you done with Crystal? Is this even the right channel anymore? I came up with these drum parts specifically just for this collaboration, so I had to be very clear in my mind what I wanted to play for each section of the song. A handful of you might know that besides just playing the drums, I also dabble in a bit of drawing. One thing that most artists do before embarking on an elaborate painting or drawing is to sketch out the rough idea first. You can do the exact same thing when you're planning out a song by working out the structure. This song is fairly simple. It's written in a hymn style, so there are only four verses and no choruses or bridges whatsoever. That could be a bit monotonous if we just sang the same melody four times, so I knew I wanted to have some instrumental interludes between verses 2 and 3 as well as 3 and 4 in order to give it a bit of variation as well as to offer the other instrumentalists a little bit of a feature moment. The fourth verse could have a repeated last line for emphasis. There would be an instrumental intro as well as an outro. And I also just put one extra bar of space between verse 1 and 2 to give it a little bit of breathing room. So this is the final bar count and rough structure of the song. Once you have the whole structure down, the next step is to decide on the overall feel of each individual section before you sit down and try and play it. Each verse is distinctly in two sections of eight bars each, and it could be useful to try and change the drum beats a little bit to reflect changes in the lyrics or the music. Now, going back to our painting analogy for a moment, when a painter is trying to design their image, usually they'll have a certain subject that they want to be the focal point of that image, 
which they'll probably decide on first before adding all the rest of the details in the painting that will then draw the viewer's eye towards the main subject. For this song, when I was listening through, it was the third verse that stood out to me. The first two lines of that verse talk about Christ's death and burial, and the next two lines talk about his glorious resurrection. So when I was planning the arrangement, I knew that I wanted that to be the impact point of the whole song, and we designed it such that there was a modulation or a raise in key in that point. Once you know that that's the climax of the song, it's a lot easier to kind of reverse engineer and figure out how you want to build the song to get to that point. Here's how my second level of planning worked out. One key thing to note is that each of these sections is actually based around the exact same rhythmic backbone that I introduced in the very beginning of this video. They're all based around that same kind of anchor pattern and groove. When you're first learning a lot of beats, it can be tempting to want to change to a different beat in every single section of the song or every time you do a drum fill, but please resist the temptation. Just remember, music makes sense because of repetition. That's what makes a song cohesive. We don't change the melody of a chorus every time we sing it, so in most cases, the drum beat shouldn't change too drastically either. All right, this is where it gets a little bit intense. Your last step in creating your parts for the song in 3-4 that you're trying to play drums to is actually creating the parts. Yeah. Everyone's going to do this a little bit differently depending on the song that you're playing and your own personal style and vocabulary. So for this section of the video, we're just going to listen through to the drum isolated version of the track I played for In Christ Alone Together, and I'll give you a couple comments on how I played it. So let's have a look. I feel like I'm doing one of those reaction videos. Okay, there's nothing too fancy going on in the intro at all, but when I first started playing drums in church, these kind of sections mystified me, and the only thing that senior drummers would tell me is, color on the cymbals. And I'm like, color on the cymbals with what? Color pencils? That wasn't very helpful, but there are basically two things you want to do. One is keep time for the rest of the band that's playing and just add texture which means you're probably going to want to play lightly, delicately, using more of the tips of your stick for soft notes and maybe a couple of these cymbal swells, which are indicated in the score by these two slashes on the stem, which is also a way of showing a drum roll. But in this case, we assume that it means going from soft to loud on the cymbals. This note over here is a drag, which means you play these two grace notes softly with one hand and the main note is slightly louder with the other. And that can be a really nice texture, especially when you play the main note on the bell of a cymbal. Okay, in the verse, I was actually playing the exact same rhythm that I introduced in the beginning of this video, which is one, two, and a three, and a. Previously, I introduced it in the context of the kick and snare where it sounded like doom, ba, doom, ba. But if you play that exact same rhythm on the floor tom, this is how it sounds like. In the second bar, I'm just adding one more note on the E of two to make it a two bar phrase, which means it's a two bar pattern that I'm repeating. And over here at the fourth bar, there's just a little bit of a fill, which is two extra notes on the last two 16th note counts. Realize that I played the right symbol there on the fifth bar of the phrase. That is actually a little trick I use sometimes to help myself to keep track of where I am in a phrase. Doing something a bit different at the halfway point just helps your brain to remember where you are in the song. Especially in this case, I was actually playing the track to a click, so I didn't have any melody reference at the point of time of recording. It can be pretty useful to learn how to do a small sort of cymbal crescendo, I wouldn't call it a roll, but an increased in volume from soft to loud with one hand so that you can keep the groove going with the other hand, especially if you're playing a tom beat. This 
this is still keeping to a similar rhythm, but I introduced the mid tom for the first time to cue a bit of a change, but this fill is actually in the seventh bar of the phrase, and then there's a pullback in bar eight. You realize that I stopped the left foot momentum over here so that it's a complete pause in terms of the rhythm, and then there's cymbal crescendo, and we start again in verse two. Right, if you are not familiar with drum notation, this can look a little bit intimidating because there's a lot of notes everywhere, but the main accent pattern is actually exactly the same. One, and a two, and a three. These little arrow signs are accents, which indicate that these are the loud notes, and those are actually the same ones that we were playing earlier. Beat one is still on the bass drum, the O of one is now in the mid tom, that's the left hand playing the mid tom, and then our right hand plays the final two accents on the floor tom as well. We're just adding in the other notes in between. And how do you know what hand to use and when to play those notes in between? Answer is practice your single stroke roll, which is right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. If you can figure out where your accents fall on that, so in this case, we would be playing something like one E and a two E and a three E and a. Everything else in between those accents is a possibility for you to play a non-accented note, which is what all those other notes on the floor tom are. I just didn't play all of them because I wanted to leave a little bit of space here and there, but where exactly you do that is up to personal taste. Another right cymbal note in the middle. Right, this part is quite important because it's the very first time I'm introducing the snare drum note. Now you only have one chance in a song to give any particular voice or any particular instrument in your kit its first appearance. And the snare in particular is a very powerful instrument because that creates the backbeat that we're so used to. So the very first time you play that is going to create quite a shift in dynamics. So make sure that you don't use it too early in this case, I kept it to the second half of verse 2, and my main shift between the first half and second half of verse 2 is instead of playing the accent on beat 3 on the floor tom, it's now on the snare. You might notice that I also changed the sticking pattern. Previously, I said to use your single strokes. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. But over here, once I'm changing the accent on beat 3 to be the snare, if I did that, I would be having this strange crossover thing happening on the snare. Now I don't want that, so what I did was I used a paradiddle. Beat 2 is actually right, left, right, right, which frees up my left hand to play my snare back beat, and then I play another right, right, left at the end to bring it back to the floor tom on beat 1 for the next bar. So the sticking for that phrase would actually be something like this where we have half a paradiddle on beat 2 and half of an inward paradiddle, left, right, right, left, on beat 3, just so that it's easier to orchestrate this pattern with the snare back beat. This interlude is the first time we actually see that original beat that I introduced being played more or less in its full glory, but there's a couple extra things. These tiny little snare notes, you can see they're a bit smaller than the main snare notes on the O of 1 as well as beat 3. These are called ghost notes, and the one with a slash through it is basically playing that note as a double stroke. You can hear that these ghost notes mainly happen in between my right hand notes, and over here I also played three right hand notes just to keep the 16th note momentum going. I did specify there, if you noticed, that there's no backbeat in this fill because it's leading to a pullback. And the next section is actually the quiet part of verse 3. This is where we talked about Christ's death. And now with this cymbal crescendo, there will be a modulation in key.
And this is the uh, epic fill section, which is the, uh, the whole resurrection bit. And this is the contrast that we were trying to create as the highlight of the song. Now, another thing I struggled with besides the symbol coloring was creating epic fills when I first started. I didn't really know how to do that, but there's a few key principles. One is to space out your notes because playing your notes too densely does not add to that grand feel. Another one is to play more flams. Flams are when you hit with both sticks together, one softer and before the other. Second one's a bit louder. And that just gives you a more open and grand feel. The other tip is to play more bass drum notes in between your fills as well. When I first started out, I played a lot of fills only on the hands and they've just sounded really weak and thin. So playing with more kick drum notes helps to create more of that epic feel as well. And of course, just listen to more songs with fills that you like and they will get into your vocabulary eventually. Over here, we just have an epic build up going from a start on the crash and snare, which will be loud and then doing another crescendo in 16th notes, especially with the snare and floor tom together. And just to give the rest of the band more of an idea where to stop, I have a flam on the end of three, which will give a bit of a cue as to when to come in on beat one after that. Right, this is another time where we have a new texture introduced, which is the open hi-hat. This is the first time we're using the open hi-hat, so again, it brings that lift to the second half of verse 3. There's some slight modifications in the kick drum groove, but you realize that those variations only happen every other bar. Most of them, I'm still staying to the dum ka dum da as your basic rhythmic structure. And this part where it says accent with vocal melody is actually referring to the crashes on the 3, end of 3, as well as beat 1 over here. If you listen to the song, that goes together with what the vocalist is singing. One small thing in the fill I did over here, just to make sure that the, there was more of a build, in the last two bars, I kind of added another snare backbeat on two, just to give it a more driving feel. Adding downbeat snares tends to give you that building up effect, and it also changes the vibe because previously we were playing the accent on the O of one. So little shifts like that, changes to your normal structure, will give a bit of tension effect, and then you can have the release after that. This is probably the most different beat I played in this song, but our skeleton rhythm is still in there somewhere. Originally it was one and two and three, where it's kick, snare, kick, snare. In this case, it became more like kick, kick, snare, snare. And I added a, quite a lot of extra kick drum notes. So it's doom, 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 doom. But I didn't remove any of the original notes from the original beat. In that interlude, you realize I also crashed a little bit more frequently. In the previous sections, I was being very mindful not to go overboard on the crashes. And that last fill is quite a unique one. Doom, da da, doom, da da, da crash. This one is gonna reoccur in the later parts of this song, so remember how that sounds. In verse four, we're starting with this marching beat. It's purely on the snare. Again, it's still the same basic rhythmic pattern. In fact, this is very similar to our original beat. Doom, gut, doom, ba. But our snare notes are now played with flams, and you're just surrounded by a single stroke roll sticking. So this is right, left, right, left flam, right, left, right, left, right flam, left, and the last two right, left notes are double strokes. So that would be something like this. That's the whole verse four rhythm, basically.
second half of verse 4 is very similar to the interlude. There's just this kind of extra crash and snare together thing happening, which is just a way to emphasize the backbeat. Remember what I said about playing the snare on the downbeats to emphasize the buildup? Here we have another one playing the snare on two and then three and then one and then two and then the end of two. So it's a whole lot of this downbeat oriented snare which really helps to build up towards the next section. Yes, I didn't mention about that flam across two surfaces over here on the end of three. When I first started, I had no idea that you could play a flam on two surfaces, but it actually creates an even more open and grand effect. So experiment with playing your flams across two drums if you haven't. It's really useful. Right, and that was the end. The outro was pretty similar to the first interlude, nothing too different at all. When you're ending a song, you probably don't want to add any new ideas to it, so I kept it fairly simple. You might notice that this fill sounds very similar to one or two of the other fills we played earlier in the later section of the song. It's really useful to practice fills that sound similar to each other and just don't be afraid to use the same fill multiple times in the same song. If anything, it makes it sound like it belongs to the same song and not a bunch of different songs mashed together. One last fun fact for you guys, the ending of this song where I played the floor tom on one and then the crash on two was actually a complete mistake. When I was recording the demo version of this with Daniel, he botched the last chord for some reason, he kind of just muted that immediately and then played the proper chord on count two. I'm sorry to um, reveal that then, but uh, it turned out kind of nice and I liked it. And then we kept that and used it for the actual song. So the moral of the story is don't be afraid to make mistakes. Sometimes mistakes can turn out sounding cooler than you intended. Just make sure that it's actually something that sounds good in the context of the music that you're trying to create. And that brings us to the end of this video. It wasn't anything terribly in-depth, but I hope that gave you some ideas about how to create your own drum parts for the song you're trying to write or a song that you need to play. And if there's anything that you would like me to break down further, just let me know. If not, I will... Hmm. I guess.